Good morning, LSCF Church. I'm glad you're here with us this morning on Sunday, January 17th. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you for being with us. And I pray that this morning um, you just allow God to enter your space wherever you're at. Um, and yeah, that uh, you'd be able to engage with us here this morning. strength is gone you're the one who calls me on you are the light you are the fight that's in my soul oh your resurrection fire burns like fire through the night when waters rise I lift my eyes up to your throne we are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord. I God, I conqueror. Oh, I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is He living in me than in the world. No surrender, no defeat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair. You are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. Will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious and nothing is impossible every chain is breakable with you we are victorious and you are stronger than our hearts you are greater than the dark with you we are victorious world this life we will not bow to sin or to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our god our conqueror
Well, hello there. Getting ready for bed. Probably not at this time of the day, but having a seat, enjoying a story would be wonderful. So, oh, would you like to hear one more quick story? Then hold on to your bear or your beanbag buddy. Get comfy and snug and we'll sit back and study the tale of a godly good government guy. A government guy who would not cheat or lie. No, no, no. It's true. He did. He was. I'm not making it up. And I wouldn't because God expects the truth. And so Daniel was true. Just as true as true blue ever did or even could do. Daniel did his job well. In fact, he was the best. He was honest and truthful, wise, thoughtful, and blessed. So you'd think that his workmates would love him. They must. But they hated his godly, good governing guts. So those grouchy old guys took their grumpy gray heads and they thought up a plan to destroy Dan instead. They'd catch him red-handed, smack dab in the act. And some low down dirty misdeed, but in fact, thought they slinked and they spied and they private eyed every deed Daniel did. And each thing that he tried, all those grumpy old goobers could not find one tad or wee slender small thing Daniel did that was bad. Yes, those grouchy old guys were confused and perplexed. They were scratching their heads over what to do next when right up and right out of their angry, numb noodles came thoughts so black pitched by goodles and oodles of years living outside of goodness of God. They had pestered and festered and nibbled and gnawed at a place in their hearts that was faithful and true and just chewed a big hole right out and clean through. If he will not do something that's creepy and stinky, we'll make up something, they all said. So I think we should wind up our wits and think up a new plan to get rid of that godly good government man. So the very next day, they matched, marched up to the king. They smiled a big smile and started to spring their deceitful, dishonest, and despicable trick. And the king never knew... It was over that quick. Oh, great king, they sang out, all whippy, cream, and sweet. We bow down, we kiss your two hairy brown feet. For your humble, wise servants do wish and agree that the king should proclaim a new royal decree that whoever would dare not give worship or praise or to kneel down and pray for the next 30 days unto anyone other than your own sweet self should be rounded up from his each closet and shelf and then thrown into the lions, both damsel and dude, to be chomped and to be chewed like snack, snack food. Well, that sounds good to me. Yes, that sounds like great fun. So let it be written and let it be done. With that, the king signed a new royal decree that could never be changed, not one Q or one T. Not by a king or not by a queen, not by a damsel or a dude, not till 30 long nail-chomping days would conclude. Well, when Daniel found out, it was truly a shock, but what did he do? Did he shudder? Did he knock? Did he run for the hills? Did he whimper and bend? Did he crawl into a hole and just try to pretend that he was not a mighty young man of God? He did not. No, no. For like you, he was caught up in awe by the wonder and the love of his heavenly king. And so Daniel did not change, not one wee little thing. He went up to his room and and tone, tore open the shutters and prayed till the walls and the roof and the gutters all shook with furious, wild love for God till his heart and his mind was chubby, wee bod. We're alive with new life. Yes, he prayed and he prayed, which is just what he did at that time every day. 
So they rounded them up like they said that they would. Oh, those grumpy old guys thought they had them, but good. For the king had no choice. He would not have to conclude. Daniel broke his new law and he would be chewed. Oh, yes, the king knew that Daniel was faithful and true. He was true as a true blue ever did or could do. But he made that dumb law and he knew he'd been tricked. And quite soon, little Daniel would be lapped up and licked. Yum, yum. By those hungry young lines, those fangs and those claws. But what could he do? Not one thing. So he paused. And he said, throw him on in. He would not hide his faith. But may God, whom he serves, keep him comfy and safe. Then the king ran away to his kingly size bed. And poor Daniel was thrown and left in there for dead. Well, deep down in that hole with those big hungry guys was Daniel. Did do have no surprise? For often I say, and as everyone knows, every cat loves to pray everywhere he goes. So they pulled up their rocks and their chairs and their pews and they said their hellos and their howdy you do's. They then passed the whole night, the whole godly good time, and Isaiah 11, verse 6 through verse 9. But the king couldn't sleep. He was up the whole night, just a tossing and a turning the way that you might. And your very best friend was alone in the zoo, all because of a dippity dumb thing that you did do. Well, so he ran to the den and tore open the door and yelled, Dan, are you down there? Dan yelled back, oh, sure. We were going to close with a quick word of prayer. And then once we clean up, I'll be right out there. Now, as you surely know, having church the whole night can work up a powerful, strong appetite. So when Daniel walked out, guess who got thrown in? Oh, yes. We'll just leave it at that. Liars never do win. Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service here at LaSalle Community Fellowship. My name is Ray Clausen and I'm on staff uh, here at the church. I'd like to uh, point out a couple of uh, announcements to you uh, this morning. And uh, the first of them is that uh, every Monday evening at 7 p.m. we have a Zoom Bible study uh, that uh, generally we follow one of the themes that uh, has been presented on Sunday morning, uh, but there's some variations from that as well. So that's Monday evenings at 7 p.m. and we'd love to have you join us for that. The other thing I'd like to uh, highlight is that we are going to be beginning the Alpha course uh, beginning on uh, January 24th at 8 p.m. And uh, this is an invitation that uh, would be here at the church at the uh, welcome table right at the foyer as you come in. And uh, uh, if you're interested at all in the Alpha course, I'd invite you to come and uh, join us for that. You can uh, register at, uh, for that at the church website. There's also a promo video there that you can watch and uh, find out a little bit more about the Alpha course. So we'd love for you to come and we'd also like for you to uh, invite your friends or family or colleagues or neighbors everybody to uh, just come and join us for this. Uh, it's uh, wonderfully interactive and uh, entertaining. The way it'll function is we'll have probably, uh, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes in a chat room where you'll get to visit with some other folks. Then we'll watch the video and uh, for about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll go back to the chat rooms and discuss what uh, we have learned and what we think. And um, so uh, please uh, check that out. It'd really be fun to have you join us. And uh, I think that's all for the announcements. And so I'd like to uh, pray with you and then we'll continue with our service. Father, we're so grateful today that you are here with us. You have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. And uh, so as we interact today with your scriptures, as we sing praises to you, I pray that uh, our uh, hearts would be warmed, that we would feel restored and renewed and reconnected with you. 
So we pray that uh, you would fill us with your spirit at this time. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. Now, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King Alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah If fear you lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praise Alive. 
sing a little louder You sing a little louder You sing a little louder Oh, you sing a little louder You sing a little louder In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder, in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody Sing a little louder Heaven comes to fight for me Sing a little louder I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes The hope will arise In the middle of this storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah To know that you love me still oh. Like Israel on the shore All I see is crashing waves But like Israel on the shore Through the wild you make a way And I will go where you go I will stay where you stay I don't want to go if you're not going before me I don't want to go if you're not going before me I don't want to go if you're not going before me I don't want to go if you're not going before me I want to see the land But like Moses in the desert I can't fully see your plan 
Says your love doesn't stop when I see the land from a mountain top. Oh, like Peter on the hill, I wanna make this my place. Like Peter on the hill, for your transfigured face. I will go where you go. I will stay where you stay. Oh. Cause I don't wanna go if you're not going before me. I don't wanna go if you're not going before me. I don't wanna go if you're not going before me. I don't wanna go if you're not going before me. I want you to take this cup from me Like Jesus in the garden You don't call where you won't leave I want to love like you love Want to bleed like you bleed Oh You go before I know That you've even gone to end my war You come back with the head of my enemy You come back and you call it my victory Oh You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. The love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was pray. All I did was worship And all I did was bow down All I did was stay still
I do Where my heart can see To find your truth Your mercy is the shade I'm living in You restore my faith and hope again And all I did was pray All I did was worship Lord, I will just bow down I'm just gonna stay still Oh, hallelujah You have saved For the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at the topic of Daniel in the Old Testament. <clears throat> the t theme has been living fearlessly in difficult times. Today, we want to continue that theme and look at the topic of living in enemy territory. We have already seen how Daniel mentioned, uh, remained faithful to God in the midst of a culture and belief system that was radically different from his own. He and three of his friends would rather die than compromise their faith in God. They prospered in their careers in government service in spite of, and perhaps because of, their faith in God. Daniel and some other young men had been taken as captives to Babylon when they were uh, from their own land of Judah when it had been conquered. They had not gone there willingly. But if we look at this story with a missions mindset, it seems that they were not so much taken captive by Babylon as they were sent to Babylon by God to influence a pagan culture with the reality of uh, Jehovah God's reign on earth. Daniel and his three, three friends took the opportunity to share the truth about God and their commitment to him with the king and those around him. As followers of Jesus Christ, you can probably relate to Daniel and his friends. 
our culture has many influences from our Christian forebears. But many of our beliefs are opposed by our culture, and so we often feel isolated and sidelined, if not attacked, for believing and acting the way that we do. Perhaps you are the only follower of Jesus in your classroom or in your workplace. When various social issues are discussed over a coffee break or lunch break or uh, some other um, setting like that, uh, we often feel as though we are isolated and sidelined. Uh, at least we don't share the predominant point of view. As we continue our study in the book of Daniel, today we look at chapters 5 and 6. And in this passage, Daniel finds himself face to face with lions, spending a night in a lion's den. It is a hostile, dangerous place to be. Forget cute and cuddly. These lions are more like violent and hungry. But that one night with the lions in that den could be seen as a picture of Daniel's whole life experience in Babylon. It was a hostile and dangerous place to be. He lived in enemy territory. It wasn't just one night. Daniel spent 70 years living in a lion's den. As a teenager, Daniel had been taken out of Jerusalem. That was God's kingdom, the place of security and safety. He was hauled off to Babylon, a hostile kingdom. It was a tough and stressful place to be. Danger and enemies were all around him, prowling like lions to take him down. The Bible says that our world is like a lion's den. The kingdom of this world is a hostile and dangerous place to be. There's an enemy who wants to take us down. His name is the devil, and this is how he is described in Scripture. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Just as children's books like to reduce lions to cute and fluffy little creatures, our world has reduced the devil to a comic book character who is fun-loving and perhaps a bit naughty. People dismiss the idea of a devil as old-fashioned and ridiculous, but the Bible shows it differently. There's a dangerous enemy, and he has sharp teeth. We're going to look closely at Daniel's experience in the lion's den of Babylon, and then we'll see how Jesus experienced the same thing when he came and lived here in the lion's den of this world. That will help us to understand what life will be like for those who choose to stand firm and live for God's kingdom today. So we'll progress from Daniel to Jesus and then to us. What was life like for Daniel? We're going to think of two types of enemy that Daniel faced. As we get to Daniel chapter 5, we discover that time has raced on. Nebuchadnezzar is, de is dead. His son, actually his descendant, uh, rather maybe like his great-grandson, Belshazzar is the new king on the throne. We know from archaeology that Belshazzar was put in charge of uh, Babylon temporarily by his father uh, as his father, the king, made a trip to a distant place. Actually, a lot of time has passed between the closing of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. We know that Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for 23 years already. Four others have been king since Nebuchadnezzar, and it's been nearly 70 years since Daniel left Judah. In Daniel 4, Daniel was a teenager or, or in his early 20s. Now in chapter 5, he is in his later 80s. He's an old man. He's even older than I am. There's something to be learned for us here. In the early part of this book, Daniel is a young man, and we were impressed with how he conducted himself and the wonderful impact this had in proclaiming that Jehovah God is sovereign. Now he is old, but God still has work for him to do to proclaim his kingdom. I have an older brother who was a missionary for 19 years and then taught at a seminary for another 22 years. After that, he began working part-time at a church. He defined part-time as 30 to 40 hours a week. 
When he was 77 years old, I asked him at what age God would release him from his call to ministry. He said that God does not do that. He served at that church for another five years. We never get too old to be used by God. God can use you at whatever life stage you're at. He has a mission for you. As chapter 5 opens, Babylon is only a few hours from enemy invasion and collapse. And king number 7 for Daniel. In Belshazzar, the king is wasting no time in making a splash. He's thrown this massive party, uh, even though the Medes and Persians are right outside the city waging war against them. His city is very well fortified and actually could withstand his siege for a long time. He wants to show off to the world that his ex about his extravagant lifestyle. 1,000 celebrities are there, and the wine is flowing. This is a party that pushed the limits. You get the feeling he wants to be extreme and shock his guests. Belshazzar then asks for the gold cups from God's temple in Jerusalem to be brought for him and his guests to use in their wild partying. They had been brought from Jerusalem when the captivity began. He uses these cups in the worship of other gods. Belshazzar's wickedness goes beyond that of the kings before him. By the way, human sin is always like this. It's never satisfied. There's always a need to push it a little bit further. It's a dangerous and slippery road. Whether it's partying or drugs or alcohol or pornography or money, you'll always feel that as time goes by, you're need, you're need, you need to do more and go further to get the same thrill. Can you see that in your life? Are there boundaries that you've been pushing in order to impress your friends or find satisfaction? Be careful. It's a dangerous road that you're on. Anyway, Belshazzar is about to get the shock of his life. Check out what happened, and this is from Daniel chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Suddenly they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright, his knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. Whoa, that's kind of freaky, isn't it? A message on a wall, secret writing that no one could understand. It made no sense, so Belshazzar called for the wise men to read it for him. And guess what? They couldn't understand it. So Belshazzar was in trouble. But the queen heard about the commotion and she suggested that they go and ask Daniel. But here comes the shocker. Belshazzar's response is basically, so who's this Daniel? Daniel has been completely ignored. He's been put on a shelf. He's forgotten nobody in Babylon. Despite all that he did in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, this king doesn't even know his name. That must have been tough. This is the reality of life in the lion's den. That's life in the kingdom of this world. Here's the enemy who just ignores Daniel. He gets on with his partying and Daniel gets for forgotten. Daniel isn't hated or beaten up or abused. He's just ignored. It's tragic. Belshazzar has access to the wisest man in the whole world and he doesn't even know his name. How unfortunate. Sin increases while wisdom is forgotten. Eventually they find Daniel and bring uh, him into the middle of the party. He reads the mystery writing and the message is in good. Belshazzar knew all about how Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God. He knew all about God, uh, Daniel's wisdom, but he had proudly ignored it and gotten on with his own little party. The handwriting says that Belshazzar is going to die. His kingdom is going to be divided up and given to others. His time is up. Daniel is God's messenger to Belshazzar. God is giving Belshazzar a chance to change. But will he do it? It's unbelievable, but he completely ignores what God has said. He lavishes gifts on Daniel, but he doesn't change a thing. 
He does nothing. He did not listen at all. In chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, it says, That very night Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. We know from archaeology that uh, Darius diverted the Euphrates River into a large marsh, and uh, this lowered the water level in the river. And so uh, the enemy troops were able to go underneath, uh, through the water and into the palace and or into the city and then overtake it that way. Belshazzar had made a disastrous mistake. He ignored the message of God and chose to live for ever increasing sin. He didn't hate Daniel, he just ignored him. That's the first type of enemy. And Jesus faced this enemy too. When Jesus walked the earth, there were many who simply ignored him. They dismissed him as irrelevant and unimportant. On one occasion in Mark chapter 5, verses 14 to 17, Jesus healed a man, and then the whole town came out and encouraged him to go away. They wanted to carry on with life just as it was. And people still treat Jesus that way. Many in our world would say that they don't hate Jesus, they just ignore him. It's a tragedy. He's the wisest man who's ever lived, and people don't even know his name. Daniel chapter 5 shows us that to ignore Jesus is to be his enemy. We're surrounded by those who ignore Jesus, partying hard. It's far easier just to go with the flow. Jesus can wait for another time. There's wine to be drunk and fun to be had. The devil loves to convince us that Jesus is irrelevant. We don't have to hate him, we can just ignore him. Let's put him off to the side. But hear the warning. Jesus came so that you can know God. We've all made mistakes, but Jesus came so that we can be forgiven for the wrong we've done. Jesus came <clears throat> so that we can be part of God's everlasting kingdom. By ignoring Jesus, we make ourselves God's enemies. We don't have to hate him, we just have to ignore him. It's that serious. And thus, people treated Daniel that way, they treated Jesus that way, and if we belong to Jesus, they may well treat us that way as well. If we belong to God's kingdom, there'll be times when we're ignored. We don't get invited to a party with classmates or colleagues. It doesn't feel good. It's how the enemy works. But the party of the, earth, uh, of the world will be cut short. The real power lies with God's kingdom. So Daniel stood firm and Jesus stood firm. <clears throat> and so the question for us is, are we ready to stand firm in the face of all this? But here comes the second type of en enemy. If Daniel was ignored in chapter 5, he takes center stage in chapter 6. The new king, called Darius, is impressed by Daniel. In da cha Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, it reads, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Daniel must be getting really old by now. He's been in enemy territory for close to 70 years, but he isn't ready to sit down and give up. He's still doing the best he can, working hard, doing the right thing. Things are looking good, but don't be fooled. The lions are circling. Chapter 6, verse 4 says, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. These people took office politics to a whole other level. They tell the king to make a law that for 30 days people can only pray to him and no one else. King Darius likes the sound of that. I'm sure it appealed to his eagle. He can't see what they're doing, and he passes the law. 
If anyone breaks the law, they will become lion food. Daniel once again faces a choice. He could just keep his uh, praying secret and try to stay out of trouble. Or he could obey the law and save his life. But instead, he doesn't do either of those. He does this. When Daniel heard that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Daniel isn't going to hide away. He knew where his confidence lay, not in the kingdom of this world, but in the kingdom of God. He would rather die than be disloyal to God. The enemies are watching, and as soon as Daniel prays, they run off to the king to let them know what Daniel is doing. King Darius is devastating. He has been conned. He tries to save Daniel, but he can't break his word. So what a powerless king. He was not able to save Daniel. Just as well, because Daniel's got his faith in another king. When the enemies are accusing Daniel and lying about him, Daniel says nothing. He's silent. He's not trying to save himself. Daniel has his trust in another king. And so Daniel is thrown in with the lions and the cave is sealed. But the king can't sleep that night. And early in the morning, he runs to the lion's uh, den and he calls out to Daniel in chapter 6, verse 20. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve faithfully, uh, been able to rescue you from the lions? Oh, yeah. God is the king who saves. God shut the mouths of the lions. Daniel had his confidence in the right king. He's safe. Daniel is lifted out, and his enemies are thrown in. Daniel made a wise choice. The point is pretty clear. In a dangerous world, you need to find yourself a king who really has the power to save you. Daniel uh, did that. And then you need to remain loyal to that king no matter what. And that king's name is Jesus. Daniel experienced the lion's den, and so did Jesus. Jesus left heaven a place of safety and security, and then he came and lived here in enemy territory. He was lied about and yet remained silent. He was trusting his father, the king. At his trial, the Roman governor, Pilate, tried to set Jesus free, but couldn't. Here was another ruler who could not save. Jesus went to the cross. It was as if he was torn apart by lions. His dead body was placed in a cave and a, sta a stone sealed the entrance. Then, early on Sunday morning, some woman ran to the tomb and discovered the greatest event in history. God had shut the mouth of death itself. Jesus was alive. Here is a king worth trusting. So when life is tough, don't give up. When people attack you, don't lash out and retaliate. Some people will hate you if you choose to belong to God's kingdom. People will look for ways to take you down. People will oppose you and make your life hard. When that happens, you need to know that there's a king who can save you. Don't put your hope in human saviors like friends or boyfriends or politicians or whatever. They will always let you down. It is King Jesus alone who can save us. Will you trust him even in the face of lions? Will you hold your nerve and keep on following him? We're heaven's fun creations, his pride and adoration, treasures woven by his love. His careful hands they hold us safe within his promise of calling and of destiny. And I will sing of all you've done. I'll remember how far you've 
carried me from beginning to the end. You are faithful, faithful to the end. A father's heart that's for me, a never ending story of love that's always chasing me. His kindness overwhelming and hope for me unending. He's never given up on me. And I will sing of all you've done. And I'll remember how All of 